Just so you know, I think this is, yeah, um, this is not a flow yoga class. There will be no asanas. Um, and we're going to be doing one posture, but it's like called power pose and it's not, um, not a traditional <laughs> yoga posture, but, um, no, this is more, uh, talking about yoga psychology, uh, functions of the mind. I want to look at some different aspects of mind that is, um, seen from the yoga perspective. I want you to have an opportunity to connect as a community. I see, let's see, we've got 50 people, over 50 people. I'm so excited about that. And then my hope is, is that you'll take away one ritual that you want to incorporate into your lives to help calm the commotion. So for me, just real quick, this is um, like, I graduated uh, LMU, I can't believe it, five years ago in the master's degree program. I've been a yoga teacher for 20 years. I lead yoga retreats, teacher trainings. I also do a lot of work in an organization um, called AmeriCorps. Uh, it's a national service program, specifically with VISTA's Volunteers in Service to America, and I'm a trainer and facilitator for them. And I'm really missing the work because here we are in COVID, right? And here we are on a bunch of Zoom trainings and I miss people, I miss being in person. Uh, but I'm super grateful for this opportunity to connect with all of you. For me, this workshop here is I'm going to be, you know, putting out a lot of um, content at, because we have an hour together. And um, but for me, this is like a merging of some content that I've been studying and immersing myself with yoga, but also emerging of some of the content and passion that I have for communities uh, for, um, community development work and kind of bringing those two together. So it's fun topic for me. Um, and my, my passion is about teaching yoga from a broader perspective. Um, I love the asanas, don't get me wrong, but I love, uh, the study of the mind and how the mind works. And I love right now that we are in such a great, exciting time where science is basically, you know, proving uh, much of what the, uh, the, the ancient yoga practitioners have been um, reading about, experiencing, practicing for um, you know, thousands of years. So that's really exciting. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen here. So I do have a slideshow for us and we'll get that going. Get it on present mode here. Awesome. So here we are. Let me play with my screen here for a little bit. Okay. So I wanted to start with a quote. Oh no, not that. Oh, one thing is I'm sure you've been on Zoom all day, so you don't need these Zoom guidelines really, but um, there will be a time, I wanna tell you that we are gonna go into breakout groups just for a few minutes to share something later. And when you get into the breakout group, just make sure that you accept the invitation and that's all you have to do. So you'll accept the invitation and uh, you'll be put into breakout groups and then it'll pull you back into the main, main group. We're gonna do that once for sure, maybe twice uh, if we have time at the end. If you like to take notes, have a pen and notebook ready. There will be um, one exercise that I have you do that you'll just write something down. So, um, oh, and I think it's, it is a nice thing to say to just have grace with ourselves and uh, about this process of using Zoom. You know, every time I'm on it, I, use, I learn something new and um, <laughs> am enlightened by something. <laughs> so again, thanks for being here. So I wanted to start with a quote. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. This is one of my absolute favorite quotes and I intentionally put a picture of rain behind it because I thought this was a really good example. Um, I am teaching this course from Southern California. So we don't get rain very much. And in fact, today was like our first gloomy day in a long time, I'm in San Diego area. And so when we get rain, in fact, we might have possibility of rain this week, like it's exciting. You know, for me, it's like, I love the rain, let it rain. I wanna see the rain, it's very cleansing. It's great for the plants and you see the birds like bathing in the rain and um, it can be a relief from drought if we're having a drought year and it just can feel really cleansing. And, and so 
for me, when I see rain or when I smell it, right. Or when I, when I take when I touch it or taste it or hear the rain, like I love it. Um, although sometimes, right. Depending on where you are and what your experiences with rain have been in the past, that might be a totally different experience. So you could see rain or depending on the time of life, um, when I lived in San Francisco and it rained all the time, uh, it was like, I don't want it to rain, right? You want the rain to go away. You want sunshine. I'm sick of the rain. It can create flooding. It can, you know, create a mess in my yard, or it can just be a mess of driving in the streets. So really rain is just rain, but how we see the rain depends on our perspective, right? The own unique lens that we have, that we see the world through. And it's really the mind, our mind that interprets the rain, right? It's the, it's the way in which we place meaning to things through the way the mind works. And this is unique to all of us. So I feel it is incredibly important that we get to know how it is that our mind is interpreting things. And this can help us in navigating our own minds. So I'm just gonna keep moving on. And some of you may be familiar with these terms. Some of you, I know this could be the first time you're hearing these terms, but um, I wanted to share with you the four functions of mind, how yoga sees it. And this is the manas mind, the ahankara, the buddhi and chitta. And the monist mind is the part of our mind that what I like to call the ordinary mind. And it, it coordinates the senses, but it, it like takes an in information, right? It's the aspect of our mind that takes an in information from our sensory experiences, from that rain touching our skin, from the, the smell of the rain. It's the way in which we bring in information. And then the Ankara mind is, that's the aspect of mind that then identifies something. Like, I like the rain, I don't like the rain. I want more rain, I want less of the rain. It's the aspect of our minds that identifies with the roles in our life. You know, I'm a yoga teacher, I'm a, a sister, I'm an auntie, I'm like all of these things and that we, the responsibilities and roles that we play in life, right? We attach it. So. This is the ego identification. It's not a, like a bad thing. I think the ego gets such a bad rap, like, oh, here I go in my ego again, you know? Um, but the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function of the mind. We all have it. And I think it can be uh, a dangerous aspect of our minds because it can limit us. So, when we start to get attached to those roles and responsibilities and the likes, the dislikes, the things we want more of and the things we want less of, right? We know that that can create some suffering and it can also create a, 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 fe a feeling of limitation in our lives. So we have the Buddhi mind, which is, you know, it's considered the inner observer, the witness, the intelligent aspect of mind. And this is a beautiful part of mind. And this is where, when you may have read the description of this workshop, this is where we wake up the witness. We want to actively engage with our Buhi mind and wake it up. If you've done any kind of mindfulness practice, that's what you're doing. You're basically saying to yourself, I'm going to observe something without getting actively involved in it that you can pull back. And this is such an amazing function of our minds. So the other thing that the booty can do, so it's not just observing, it can discern. It can discern between what's real and unreal. So for instance, let's say I'm worrying about something. Let's say I'm worrying about getting sick, right? I'm sure that some of you have been worrying during this time of COVID about getting sick, or maybe you got a sore throat, or maybe and you thought, oh my gosh, I have COVID. Um, so our, our, our minds, our imagination goes crazy, right? And what the booty can do is it can pull back and say, wait, actually, you're feeling pretty good. You don't have a temperature, you're feeling pretty energized, you're sleeping great, you're eating, you're, you know, you have, you're, you're functioning just fine. So the worry is an unreal imaginatory 
aspect of mind that's happening right now. So the Buddha not only can observe it, but can then say, in reality, you're healthy right now. Or let's say you're uh, feeling lonely and your mind starts to carry on with the story of, you know, I don't have any friends, I don't have any family, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all alone in the world and all of this stuff, right? The story starts happening and the booty would say, actually, you do have people in your life. All you gotta do is pick up the phone and call them. So it's an incredible aspect of our minds that we can utilize to take us not just out of the ordinary mind, but into a real place of intelligence, of, a, of great awareness. And then we have the chitta. The chitta is the container of memories, habits, and beliefs, right? This is the place that um, all of our past lives. And again, not a bad thing, it just exists. And the good thing about it is we got to get to know it because this is where we can stay stuck in the past. And this is where we can stay stuck in that worry that I just mentioned, um, or those stories of, well, I've been alone in the past. And, you know, so those things can come up. And the, the cool thing about it though, is that this is either the place where we can stay stuck in worry, cynicism, negativity, or it can be the place that propels us in having faith, trust, and positivity. So again, none of these aspects of mine are, you know, better than the other. It's just a nice way of knowing that the mind functions in very specific ways. And can we activate all aspects of our minds to get to know ourselves better so that when that commotion starts to happen in our mind, we can then deliberately choose a practice to calm it down. And so the first practice we're going to do, it's a simple one. It's waking up the witness. You maybe have done a practice similar to this. I call this the, um, you know, the, the television practice where you are observing the screen of your mind. And so we're just going to take a few minutes, probably only about two minutes to do this. This is where we attend to the mind, but we don't attach to it. So I'm going to ask you to close down your eyes. You can sit up, you know, find a comfortable seat, close down your eyes. And as you close down the eyes, just take a deep inhale through the nose. Let's exhale, sigh it out through the mouth. And as you close the eyes, just imagine that the backs of your eyelids are like a TV screen. And your mind is the TV screen of thoughts, feelings, ideas, and you are the watcher. And you don't have a remote control, so you can't pause, rewind, or fast forward. Just simply allow yourself to watch the story of your mind with all of its characters and dialogue. And as the mind has a tendency to cling to an idea, to a feeling, a thought, it might start to judge or analyze. Just tell yourself, not right now. You're simply the observer, the witness. It's taking about 30 more seconds to just simply 
watch the story of your mind. No pausing, no rewinding, no fast forwarding. All right, go ahead and come on back. And this, the reason why, this is a very, very simple practice, but it's incredibly important to be able to observe the workings of your own mind. The, the benefits are incredible. Uh, we get to know the patterns of mind. So a lot of the research says we have between 50, I mean, I've read, read different, different articles on this, but between 50 to 90,000 thoughts a day. So the mind is constantly active. And it's, I think it's kind of a, a, it's a paradox in one way that we have to engage the mind in order to calm the mind. But um, if we can use that witness to observe the patterns, because the majority of thoughts we have a day are habitual and we've had them before already. So we've had those thoughts already. So when we can watch the activity of the mind, we can then get to know how our minds work, the tendencies of our own mind to have these habits and patterns. And then we can get to know what our triggers are, right? Those things that um, create a reaction in us. And what we want is to be able to cultivate more of a pause and increase our patience before we react or respond to something. So it encourages that pause. It says, okay, I'm just gonna witness how I'm feeling right now, what I'm thinking and what's going on with that story. The other thing, and this is more of a really great thing for uh, us yoga practitioners, is the understanding of self expands, meaning that as we wake up the witness, we actually start to have a direct experience of understanding the vastness of who we are, meaning that we realize we are more than our thoughts. So our reality of our own experience broadens. And we're able to pull back and not get caught up in that spiral of thinking. All right, so moving on, I wanna share another quote with you all. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world awaits in darkness for the light that is you. So a little bit of inspiration here to remember that this brokenness of the world that we see a lot of is another way the mind works. So the default mode of the mind is to look to what's wrong. It will scan its environment to find what is broken, what is wrong, what is flawed. Um, and the other thing is that it immediately tries to fix it. But, <laughs> but the default mode is to look to the negativity of what is happening in our lives. So we need to recognize that about ourselves. Again, we're not bad people when we look to the negative of something, but we do have that ability to say, hey, right now I can shift that. So setting intention to do so is amazing. And we know this, it's, it's affirmations or intentions, sankalpa in yoga. So I wanna talk a little bit about the power of this aspect of our minds to focus on something and to refocus towards something very specific. Because remember, we have to engage the mind in order to calm the mind, which is very paradoxical, I know. So setting intentions. I bet you've heard this in many of your yoga classes before where you set an intention at the beginning of class. Sometimes the teacher does it, sometimes you do it. And sankalpa, the meaning of the word is kind of a cool thing. So kalpa means vow or rule above all rules and san means 
connection with highest truth. So a sankalpa is really a commitment or a vow we make to support our highest truth. And I think it's really important to know that whatever it is that we want in life, we already have, right? We know that yoga is one of the most positive psychologies on the planet, that we have everything we need right here and now. We know everything we need to know. We just got to tap into it. So when we're setting intentions, it's not about going out and getting something. It's actually about realizing this amazingness that you already are. So present tense, here and now, always setting your intentions as if it's already true for you right now, using positive and uplifting words is essential. Uh, short and simple. I always say make short, simple intentions, mostly because then it's easy to remember. The other thing when you set intentions, it's important to stick with an intention over time until you really feel like it's been integrated and until you feel that you, you know, you've, you've really integrated it into your life and you do feel it to be true for you on the regular. Uh, if you're a, a visual or creative artistic kind of person, you can use color and image and symbol and light uh, in order to kind of like ramp up or, or amp up your, your intention really. Um, you don't have to do that, but I know some people really like to attach uh, imagery and colors and symbols and things to their intentions. Uh, what is important is to activate all the senses. So we want to get when we set intention, and this you can do this in the beginning of your yoga classes, you can do this at the beginning of your day, which is when I highly recommend you do it. And you sit for just a moment, um, whatever your intention is, you, you, you say it to yourself, you repeat it, and you really activate it in you right here, right now. So you want that intention to, to have a felt sense in your body that it's true for you. So I have some examples. Um, of some what I would consider good intentions or, or effective intentions. I am safe and secure. I think, you know, right now in this time, we could be feeling uh, a little fearful. And um, that would be a nice intention to to set I am safe and secure if you're feeling fearful or scared in any way. I have complete trust in myself and in life. Uh, this is one of the highest teachings in yoga, right? Is trustful surrender in trusting in, in all of the circumstances of life to, to be catalysts for our own upliftment. Um, and I, again, I think right now, you know, especially if, if you're like me where your, your work pretty much disappeared overnight and you're wondering about 2021 <laughs> and, trying to maintain hope, but really just like trusting in how things are unraveling in your life and unfolding in your life and knowing that uh, we're here to learn and to grow and to, to surrender to some of these circumstances that, that really may allow for deep transformation. Uh, my heart is filled with love and joy. This is one of my favorites when I'm taking the world too seriously. Like when I just start to be too serious about life, my heart is filled with love and joy. Uh, my life is filled with abundance. Uh, if you're finding yourself in that lack consciousness where you feel like you don't have enough, you aren't enough, uh, the not enough mentality, which again, I think is prevalent in our culture. Um, I am patient and productive. This is if you, you're having, you know, if you're having some frustrations around time, uh, just having that patient and, and productive uh, wish. I stand in my personal power. Oh, this is one of my favorites. And um, I do this with power pose. So this is the, the posture we're going to do together. If you're willing, you don't have to do this. You don't have to stand. You can sit and just raise your arms. But one of my favorite uh, things to do if I'm feeling uh, kind of nervous or I'm feeling like I'm not really standing in my power. I'm not feeling empowered right in the moment. So I will do what's called power pose. I'm sure some of you saw this TED talk where you kind of stand up and you separate your feet a little bit wider than your hips and you just reach your arms up out. And I like to do peace fingers with this one. You can do this sitting down too. You can just kind of raise your arms out, but sit nice and tall with your chest open 
and just feeling this power that we know right here in our solar plexus, right? This is the energy zone of our personal power. So you might even want to just like rub your belly a little bit and just kind of feel that energy zone in your solar plexus, kind of above the navel, below the heart. And then as you reach your arms out, like imagining you've just got this nice power, feeling energized with strength and courage. And then I have a, my own personal affirmation for this posture is I so got this. So whatever this is in your life that's causing you some commotion in your mind, I'm just saying a few times, I so got this with meaning, with the feeling of it being true for you right now. And then you can just slowly lower the arms down. So that's one of my go-to affirmations. And I'll admittedly say that I do it, you know, before every presentation I give. I did it in the bathroom at LMU before I would go and give my <laughs> presentations in grad school. And, you know, science now knows that like how we poise our bodies <laughs> affects what we're thinking about ourselves. So the way that we position our bodies, even the, uh, the expressions on our faces affects what we're thinking about ourselves. You know, a smile makes you feel lighter. A frown makes you feel sadder. So um, anyway, stand in my personal power. I so got this. I am generous and kind. I think this is a good one if you're feeling kind of agitated or kind of closed off to people in the world. I flow through life with grace and ease. This one, I, <laughs> I said this one a lot when you're feeling any kind of resistance to what's happening in life. Like I know the first few months of COVID, I was, I was, I have a new term I was calling like resistance meltdown. I was having these like at least once a week, I was having like a mini meltdown about like, I just was not in acceptance of what was happening. I was just sort of resisting. So this was a good one. I flow through life with grace and ease. If you're feeling any kind of resistance about what's happening in your life. I am peaceful and relaxed. And this is just obviously a really good go-to one um, when you're feeling anxious or stressed. So what I would like you to do now is take a moment and I want you to create your own personal intention that, and it can be one of these absolutely, or, or it can be a variation of one of these, or it can be something totally that's unique to you something that will assist you in the refocusing of your mind when you get caught in that, you know, worry, impatience, negativity, cynicism, right? All right, so now we are going to, this is the opportunity I wanted to give you to go into breakout groups. And let me see, where is my, I am going to stop, there we go, stop sharing my screen. I wanna go back into the chat here and I want you to, and I'm hoping you'll be willing you're going to be in a small group with three, maybe four people. You're going to have about uh, six minutes. So each of you will have about two minutes. So it won't be too long. Um, and I want you to share your name and what your intention is and share it with meaning. So, and not like I am generous and kind, but I am generous and kind. And here's why 
I chose this intention at this time. So if you're willing to share a little, a few words as to why you chose that intention and why that uh, resonates with you at this time, that would be lovely. And so our tech support is going to put you into breakout groups. Here we go. Just make sure you click on join breakout room and then we'll come give you a minute warning when it's time to come back. So if you're still in the main room, you'll want to join breakout room with a little that how many are still here? There are quite a few. They're likely people who might have stepped away from their computers. Ah, yes. Okay. Thank you. So question, I um, how do, how do I say? So as you come on back, if you are willing, please share your intention in the chat. Right, the more we share it and type it, the more we start to integrate it and feel it. Nice. I love it. I'm strong and healthy. I intend to see the goodness around me. Yes. Fullness of myself. I love it. So yeah, if you're as you're coming back, if you would feel uh, like move to share in the chat, that would be lovely. I love that. I know what to do. I'm relaxed and productive. Yes. Great. All right. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to um, move into the next piece. And uh, I love this. I'm strong in my purpose. I create love. I love with you. Yay. I love it. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again. And we're going to move into something that some of you maybe have heard called Pratipaksha Bhavanam. And this is, hang on, let me get into presentation. Here we go. All right. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. There is a great sutra 233 that speaks to this idea of when we are disturbed by negative thoughts, opposite positive ones should be cultivated. So I think we can all acknowledge and be humbled by the fact that we have and directly experience negative thoughts, thoughts that um, you know, can take us down a path of uh, feeling, you know, down, blue, angry, frustrated. And there's these great tools that, this is what I love about yoga, you know, thousands of years ago, they must have been having the same challenges with their minds that we have today. And in the community development work that I do, we use a, school, a, a tool called opportunity thinking, which speaks to this exact ancient practice of 
Vitarka Bhadani Pratipaksha Bhavanam. It looks for the positive, the opportunity in things that are happening. It challenges our assumptions by asking us to think outside the box and to broaden the scope into what could be possible. So when the mind goes towards the problem, which again, we have this function of mind, right? We have that reptilian aspect of our minds that scan our environment to look for what's wrong, to look for what's threatening, to look for the negative, to look for the problem, the flaw. And so what we need to do is at that point, when we recognize our minds doing that, because we've woke up the witness, right? The witness is, is the, the first step in all of this, <laughs> because we've got to notice when we're doing it. If we don't notice when we're doing it, if we don't notice when the mind is being cynical, when it's worrying, when it's critiquing, when it's going down that spiral of negativity, if we can't recognize it, then we get caught up in it. So again, waking up the witness is the first step to all of this, that buddhi mind that can observe and watch. And then we can redirect with intention, with practices like what I'm gonna be calling opportunity thinking. And it's a specific practice to shift the mind and to refocus. It actually asks you to challenge your assumptions. Instead of just jumping to a judgment, you're gonna pull back and say, well, wait, what else could be? What else could be? What are the opportunities, the advantages, the savings, the benefits of what's happening right now? Instead of just looking to the flaw. And now we need to look to the problem, right? It's not like we, we don't want that function of our mind, but what we wanna do is we wanna start thinking more creatively and how, and, and then how can we act in a way that's gonna be more helpful than harmful. So what I want us to do is, is do a little exercise. So I thought I could have the chat. Yes, let me pull up the chat. So pull up your chat if you hid it like mine was hidden. <laughs> and I want us to do a quick brainstorm. So I'm gonna put it in the chat. And now, right now, many of us are experiencing education going online, right? From yoga classes to our degree programs, all of that. What if all education went online? All of it went online and there was no other aspect or ways of doing education. What would be the opportunities, advantage, savings and benefits? And so, we're not looking at what would be problematic about this, right? We're looking only to what are the opportunities, advantages, savings, and benefits of all education going online. And if you would please, yes, go. We could learn from, with people from all over the world. Awesome, no commute, less driving, less carbon usage. Absolutely, save money. Pajama day. I love it. Yes. <laughs> save gas, save time, save money, support proximity with family, more productivity. I love it. These are all so great. Easier to plan out our time. Learning in pure comfort. Oh, I'm seeing names I recognize. This is so fun. All in one place. Easy instruction for kids. Yeah. I love it. Less laundry. <laughs> I love it. Learning to manage your time. Absolutely. So yeah, sleep in, you get more time. I love it. These are all great, great responses. Less gas. Awesome. Thank you. So the reason why I wanted us to do kind of a, a hypothetical is because often when we want to practice, you know, take on a new practice, it's important to, to practice with things that maybe aren't as, uh, you know, challenging or aren't as personal so that we can refine the skill. And I can tell you from my personal experience, I've been practicing this skill for now 25 years, I think I learned it 25 years ago. And by the way, opportunity thinking is a term uh, coined by a man named Edward de Bono. And he wrote a book called Seven Thinking Hats. And so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you might wanna check out that book, Seven Thinking Hats. 
by Edward de Bono. And here I'll put his name in the chat for you. Um, I've been practicing this for 25 years and I come from a, a family that was really gifted in being critical and a lot of judgment. And so I grew up in this environment with, uh, you know, particularly one of my family members who's who I'm really close with is really gifted <laughs> in looking to the flaw and finding the problem. And I think this is, again, the mind does this because we want to then solve the problem, right? We want to then, we, we wanna find out what it is and then we wanna quickly solve it. Uh, I taught problem solving at a community college for uh, a whole decade. And all the research says about problem solving that we jump too quickly to solving the problem without giving ample time in really checking out what is going on and analyzing the problem. And so opportunity thinking is a way of analyzing what else could be going on. What are actually the benefits, the advantages, the savings, and the opportunities within this problem. And if we look at problems in a broader way, then we can get more creative in, in solving them. So in summary, opportunity thinking focuses more on what you do with what happens to you than it does on what has happened to you. So we know this in, in yoga practice, right? We, we want to be aware of all that we're going through physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And then we got to figure out what is the right practice for me right now? You know, we know as, as the more advanced we get in our practice, we're constantly asking ourselves this question, you know, what am I doing now and why am I doing it? And so opportunity thinking can help us to really give creative responses to what's happening in our lives. Instead of that, that knee jerk triggered reaction. All righty. So you've heard of the 80, 20 rule, right? So I would say, this is what we aim for, you know, 20% of the time, focuses on what happens to us. And then 80% of the time, but what can we do with it? And what can we do about it? Can we cultivate the opposite? Can we create more opportunities? Can we see the advantage and the benefits and the learning and the growth that comes from all the circumstances in our lives? All right, the challenge is, is that it requires suspending negativity for a while. It'll come back though, don't worry. <laughs> All right, so let's carry on. Gosh, we've only got nine minutes left. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of making daily rituals. I'm a big fan of this. I have my own morning rituals and night rituals. This is one I'm sharing uh, that is absolutely one of my favorites that I've stuck with for a few years now. And it's it's taken straight from this amazing journal called the five minute journal. And if you're into journaling, uh, you can go and purchase this, of course, on the marketplace of Amazon or uh, their own marketplace, which is intelligentchange.com, intelligentchange.com. Uh, but the morning ritual, you wake up, you grab your journal, you write down three things you're grateful for right away, right away. And then you write down three things that would make today great. So you think about your day, what would make today great? And then you write down your intention. And like I said earlier in this uh, workshop, I, I strongly encourage you to stick with an intention over time until it feels completely integrated. Like you really believe it to be so, to be alive and well in, a, and well in you always. Uh, and then the nighttime, right before you go to bed, you review your day. What are the th three things that made today great? And then finally, what's one thing I could have done differently today? So there's the reflection of, you know, if I had the day over, what's one thing I would do differently? You know, do more yoga, walk more, exercise more, drink less, or drink, yeah, drink less wine, um, <laughs> whatever it is. So what I found over time when I did this ritual 
is the coolest thing started to happen. And I would not have known this if I hadn't tracked it on paper, like actually wrote it down, is that the morning ritual of three things that would make today great started becoming the three things that made today great. Meaning that it ended up being kind of a manifestation journal that I was hoping for these three things to happen. And then they did happen. And so it's like setting that intention out there often makes things happen as many of us know. But this is really, I again, rituals establish meaning and strengthen our ability to focus on something helpful. And we have a lot of mundane rituals that we do in our day, right? We brush our teeth, we wash our hair, we do dishes, we may or may not make our bed. Uh, but having rituals that infuse meaning into your life can be very, very powerful. And, how, and also how we begin and end our day is, is really important. And we know that in the yoga tradition, you know that at the beginning of the day and the end of the day are very auspicious times for meditation and practice. And I wanna to encourage too, that when we, when we make daily rituals, that it really is a shift in creating intentional living in our lives instead of just like having this random existence and, and getting caught up in, in the whims of our mind or the, or the whims of other people, right? But when we create ritual, we're, we're deciding to live an intentional life, an intentional life. All right, so here we go. Uh, Finally, another sutra for you that talks about practice. And, you know, we know that practice makes progress, right? Establishing a ritual is important. And practice becomes firmly established when it has been cultivated uninterruptedly with devotion over a long period of time. So make a commitment. I want to end this session by just really encouraging you. Uh, to make a commitment, make a vow, set an intention. And what is a practice that you're willing to try and commit to for a period of time? Is it the simple practice of, you know, waking up the witness and doing some mindfulness practices of just deliberately saying to yourself, right now, I'm gonna simply observe, observe my mind, observe my feelings, observe my responses to things, observe my environment. You know, simply become that witness where you pull back and you're not attaching to anything, but you're attending to what's happening. Or set an intention, an, an intention and make it a ritual. Say it to yourself with meaning, right? With the, with the senses alive in you saying, this is true for me right now. I am peaceful and relaxed, right? I am generous. I am kind. I am safe. You're saying it with meaning and that really heartfelt. Cultivating the opposite. Deciding that when your mind goes down a negative path or it starts to get cynical or judgmental or you just start to feel blue or sad, you know, how can you hijack that spiral of story and say, no, right now, this is true. Maybe this is true. This terrible thing is happening or this thing that I don't want to happen or I am suffering. It's not to negate it and to, to pretend it doesn't exist, but instead it's about saying, well, what else? How can I broaden my scope and how can I pull back and see this from a different perspective? So it is about the both and. It's not about saying no negativity exists, right? And then again, the journaling. I can't express this enough, how uh, important I think reflection is and journaling and writing down things is. Maybe there's, uh, you wanna start the AM and the PM uh, five minute journal and you can create your own ritual. You know, you can create, I've also kept gratitude journals for many years. And again, it's a great way to start your day. And then you find over time that the more you are grateful, the more you have great you you have to be grateful for. <laughs> so it, it kind of snowballs, which is really great. Um, so 
I'm seeing now that we have about four minutes left. And what I wanted to do, if you're willing, is to just take another three minutes in breakout groups to share with another. Um, and again, it can be about three people per room. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, you know, sharing what your commitment is going to be in moving forward from, from this hour workshop today. Or maybe it's, if nothing resonated you in the, with you in this presentation, then maybe it's something that you've already experienced today that you want to take with you. So I'm going to stop sharing. All right, you're going. As you make your way back into this group, if you want to, again, throw into the chat the practice that you're hoping to take with you as you move forward into the rest of your day and the rest of your weekend, and hopefully you make it a ritual. So thank you again so much for joining me today. Um, it is always an honor to share yoga with you, with anyone. And I'm, I wish I could meet all of you here today. Um, maybe I'm going to put you on gallery view real quick. Oh yeah. There, look, I get to see all the faces, beautiful faces. Thank you for being here and for your willingness to do this amazing work and be on this amazing journey. Thank you, Danielle, for this beautiful presentation and for teaching us how we can be intentionally more compassionate, accepting, and more true to ourselves in our daily lives in a practical way. Yeah, very practical. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Shanti, Shanti. This concludes this presentation. We'll go on a short break and then go on to the next one. Namaste.